Well, good morning. Good to see each and every one of you here today. And we're so glad that you're in God's house. It turned a little cold on us this weekend. Uh, we was, uh, yeah, we a lot of people turned their heat on, and, and it was uh, that rain brought in some cold. And but so we're glad that you're here. We pray that you've had a good week this week. We want to pray for some that are traveling. Uh, we have many that are traveling today. Uh, we uh, went down to my uncle's funeral yesterday. He did pass away this week, and so we went down yesterday morning, yesterday afternoon, uh, and was there at that funeral. So continue to remember the Earl Heatherly family there in Galveston, Tennessee. Remember them. Jean, Jean has a special prayer request we mentioned this morning, so we want to continue to lift them up. Uh, does anybody else have a, a request that they want to mention? Let's remember Jeanette, and let's continue to remember Angel. Yes. Okay. Okay, the Campbell family, remember them. Any others? Okay. Okay. Okay, let's remember all these co-workers. Any others? Okay, thank you. Any others this morning? Okay, well let's go to the Lord in prayer as we lift up these petitions and, and pray for our service as the Holy Spirit would move in our midst this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful day that you've given to us. We thank you for allowing us to wake up this morning. We thank you for allowing us to come here uh, together, together to worship you. We thank you for the Sunday school lessons. We've been talking about hope, and, and we know that uh, we've lost a loved one this past week, and, and our hearts are, are, are heavy, our hearts are empty, dear Lord, but you have filled them with the hope. We have that hope that we'll see them again. We have the hope of glory the hope of heaven, and we thank you that as a Christian we have that. And Lord, there are many requests that have been made known this morning. You know each and every heart. You know each and every uh, request that is made, and we pray that you would answer it according to your will. We pray that you would move in a special way in all these situations. Uh, some have special requests that no one really knows about, but you, and we pray that you would move there. We pray for these that have lost loved ones, that you would uh, just comfort them as only you can. We pray for uh, those that are going through um, physical and, and emotional problems, dear Lord. Uh, we, we just pray that you would be with our church, continue to bless everything that we do. Uh, dear Lord, we, we know that we're coming out of the pandemic slowly, uh, but Lord, we pray that you would continue to be uh, with those that would be vaccinated, those that are still struggling with the uh, catching, uh, catching it, dear Lord. And we, we have seen some that have been fully vaccinated, have, have caught it. And maybe it's not been as severe, but it was a, it was a struggle. Uh, we talked to some yesterday who have had it. And dear Lord, you have brought them through, but they're still uh, going through some, some issues physically because of that. And we pray that you would touch them. And we just pray that you would be with our nation. Bring us back to you. Bring us back to, to, to worshiping you and, and focusing upon you and not upon ourselves, dear Lord. We pray that you would be with this service this morning. I pray that you would remove me out of the way. Your Holy Spirit would speak to us as only he can. And dear Lord, lives would be changed because of your word uh, that you have brought to us this morning. We ask these things in the most beautiful, precious, and holy name that we know, that of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, we'll be looking at verses 9 through 14 this morning, uh, and we're asking the question and preaching a message that we've entitled, How Should One Go to Church? How Should One Go to Church? And we see that we've been talking about the church since we finished our last series, and we've been looking at different things about the church, but God laid upon my heart this, this particular message, uh, and so we want to read here about two individuals that go to church. Now, when we say go to church, let's understand that because we come out of the pandemic, we need to understand the church is not just a building. We don't just go to church. We are the church. But we go to a place to worship together, to when we gather together. So I could have titled it, How Should One Gather Together to Worship the Lord? Uh, but we understand what we mean. But, but to be theologically correct, we shouldn't say we're going to church because we are the church. Uh, but we understand that, and we just need to understand that we are the church. But let's begin here uh, in verse uh, 9 of chapter 18 in Luke. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. 
the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote unto, uh, upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. May God add, add a blessing to the read his word. May we have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that's receptive to his word this morning as we have read the inspired, inerrant, infallible, and indestructible word of God, which we believe to be truth without any mixture of error. How? Should one go to church? That's the question we're asking. You know, today we turn our attention to a parable shared about two men who went to the temple to worship. This parable is intended to teach us the truth that there is a proper way to worship and there is a wrong way to worship. There's a right way to approach God and there's a wrong way to approach God. This, this morning, I want to preach about something that we should be thankful for. And that is the privilege of coming to God's house. That is the privilege that we have to gather together to assemble with Christian brothers and sisters and others uh, that may be lost that come into the midst to, to assemble together, to, to fellowship. You know, we have been given a great privilege. And do you realize what a great privilege that we have been given living in this place that we call America? As citizens of the United States, we have many freedoms. And one of those is the freedom to worship. We have the privilege of getting in our vehicles every time that the church doors are open and driving down to the house of God to assemble together to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I'm afraid that privilege of going to church or gathering together is a privilege that many take for granted. And there are a few indicators that that privilege is being taken granted by people in the United States. One is a lack of faithful attendance as some only come at Christmas or Easter or maybe once a month or occasionally. It's not the priority in their life. Another is there's no seriousness and reverence about worship and the time that we gather together. Another is thinking that the service and the programs, the, the, the everything about the church is all about me and all about an individual. Just like the Pharisee, many have an I or a me mentality. And, and uh, you know, it was mentioned this morning in Sunday school about that many have the I and the me mentality. But another is being unprepared for worship. How much preparation do you put into coming to church or gathering together? How much time do you spend getting your heart ready for corporate worship? Do you pray for the services? Do you pray for the one bringing the message? Do you seek the Lord's face and ask Him to move in your life as you come together? Do you pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to you individually? Do you pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to others that may be around you and that they can make life-changing decisions? You see, I'm afraid that many of us just put on our clothes, get in our car, and we just go out of habit and we're not prepared to worship. Do you pray for the obedience of people when given the opportunity to make a decision? Many just come to church to be seen and to see. Most of the time, many just come to church without giving what they are doing a second thought. It has become routine. It has become habit. It has become commonplace. The Bible has something to say about how we gather together in church. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. He said, These things write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God. He was telling Timothy, you need to make sure that you're right when you go to worship the Lord. Uh, and so uh, the preacher, the writer in Ecclesiastes in chapter 5 verse 1 said, Keep thou foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be ready, more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. We need to look at our own life and be ready to worship and confess sin and open our hearts before God. The writer of Hebrews gives this instruction in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25. He says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. The psalmist said in Psalm 122 verse 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. In Psalm, chapter, in Psalm 100 verse 4, the Bible said, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. There was preparation 
that went on before they went into the house of the Lord. And according to the Word of God, coming to the house of God is very serious. And how we approach God is very serious. Did you know that the way that you come to God's house has an effect on you and has an effect on other people there in the congregation? So so let me share a letter that a pastor shared with his congregation about, about how worship can affect others around you. This letter was written by a high school student who had been invited by her friend to come to their church. She said, Dear Kathy, I attended your church yesterday. Although you invited me to come, you were not there. So I had to sit alone. After sitting down, a lady came up to me and informed me that I was sitting in her seat. So I graciously got up. I was embarrassed because I didn't know that seats were reserved. Finally, I climbed over some people hugging the aisle and found another seat. During the singing, I was surprised to note that some of the people that were there weren't singing at all. Instead, they looked around or they just stared into space. The pastor's message was interesting, although some of the members didn't seem to think so. They looked bored and restless. I recognized some of our classmates, a few pews in front of me, but they were giggling and passing notes, and I thought, how rude that is. The speaker uh, talked about the reality of faith, which I decided I didn't have enough faith. So the message really got to me, and I thought about walking down the aisle, but I was unsure. I saw some people walking out before the service was even over, so I figured that time must not be very important, so I slipped out also. As I left that morning, I said good morning to one couple, but they were in a hurry, and they must not have heard me as they didn't speak. My parents don't come to church. I came alone yesterday hoping to find love and a place to find worship and acceptance. And I'm sorry, but I didn't find it in your church. That letter should break our hearts. That letter should break our hearts because we don't want people coming to church and feeling that way and leaving. I pray that's not the impression that anyone gets when they come to Grace Baptist Church. But here's the reality. If you come half-heartedly trying to avoid being part of worshiping with the family of God, It is a sin that affects the service and those that are attending. If you come uh, to the service not speaking to brothers and sisters and avoiding them, it is a sin that affects your walk with the Lord and it affects others in the congregation. If you're covering your ears, slumping down in the pews, not paying attention, crossing your arms instead of paying attention, and, and not truly listening to hear from God, it shows your lack of spiritual maturity and just how childish you can be. If you're criticizing the songs, you're criticizing the worship leader, criticizing a pastor, it shows you do not have the right attitude to truly worship. We have some who come to be seen instead of seeking the Lord. We have some who are proud of their goodness, thinking that it's all about them, criticizing and finding fault with the ministry, the pastor and the service, and they are grieving the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, we have many who are desperately seeking Jesus, and they truly want to worship in spirit and truth. You see, our attitudes and our actions say so much about where we are spiritually. Some people come seeking God, but others with half-hearted worship are a hindrance to them. In our passage, the Lord Jesus allows us to go into the temple with these two people as they gather to worship, and we see two individuals that come to worship. Now, there are three questions that our text poses. First, why do you and I come to church? Second is, what is your attitude when you come? Third, how will you and I go home this morning? I heard about the parable of the deacon and the drug addict, and and it was by Dr. David Dykes. He's a pastor out in Texas, and I read this one time. He he was writing about this parable, and it kind of sums up this parable. So let me share it with you. It's a modern-day version of the parable that we just read. As Baptist Bob walked into church one Sunday morning, he was disgusted to see Larry Lola, for Larry was a tattooed drug pusher who had just gotten out of jail. Bob warned some of the ushers to keep a close eye on Larry because he was a no-good crook and he wasn't sure of his motives. Before the offering, it was Bob's time to pray. He walked proudly to the microphone, and he began to pray using a religious tone of voice. Heavenly Father, I thank Thee that I have been a deacon in this church for many, many years. I even remember when I helped build this building using my own two hands. 
And I thank Thee that I haven't missed a single Sunday for over ten years. There were times, O oh Lord, that I was sick, but I came anyway. Father, Thou knowest I used to sing in the choir until I was persecuted by the song leader who wouldn't sing my style of music. But I can endure persecution just like You. Thou bless, has blessed my family financially, so I'm able to give to You more than just ten percent. I keep this church alive with what I give. I thank Thee that I'm morally pure, for I don't drink, I don't cuss, and I don't smoke unfiltered cigarettes. I don't use drugs or, or, or sell drugs like someone who is in our midst this morning. And Lord, help everyone to come out tomorrow night at 7 p.m. at Oak Park Field to watch our, our softball field beat the Methodist again. And bless the gift and the giver. Amen. After napping through much of the sermon, Baptist Bob strolled out of church feeling good about himself because he had made it through another Sunday. He liked leaving church because he didn't have to think about God until next Sunday. He would think about the business of the church. He would think about little things of the church, but never think about God. Meanwhile, Larry Lolof, Lolof was slouched in the back after hearing the message about forgiveness. He slipped down to his knees. He began to pray. Holding his face in his hands, he sobbed quietly, God, I'm the dirtiest sinner in this town. I'm so sorry. I don't deserve it. But if there is any way you can wash away my filthy mistakes, would you do it? Please, God, I need you. I tell you, it was Larry Lowlife who became Larry New Life, not Baptist Bob who went home that day right with God. For he who struts his stuff before God will eventually be slapped down. But when you admit you're like dirt compared to God's purity, he'll pick you up and clean you up. Are you more like Bob or Larry this morning? Who are you like in that story? As we study these words of Jesus, I encourage you again to answer those three questions that I asked a moment ago. Why do you and I come to church? What is your attitude when you come to church? And how will you and I go home after church? In our text, we see one man came to worship himself, to be seen and to see, and the other man went to church to worship the Lord. We're going to contrast these two men because they teach us a much needed lesson of how we should gather to come to church. First of all, I want you to see the two kinds of people. The two kinds of people in our text. In verse 10, the Bible says there are two kinds of people who come to church. There was a Pharisee and there was a publican. The Pharisee was a good guy, a synagogue leader, a super religious man. The tax collector was a bad guy, the scum of the earth, the bottom of the religious food chain of Israel. If you had been a good Jew and you were listening to Jesus as he was speaking, when he mentioned the Pharisee, you would have said, hooray, you would have cheered for him. But when he mentioned the tax collector, you would have booed and hissed and said, he's no good. Just like in Jesus' day, there are those who appear saved but are self-righteous and prideful. And then there are those who know they are sinners and have confessed their sins and unworthiness to the Lord because they have a relationship with the Lord. So let's examine these two individuals. First, we see the Pharisee. Now, the word Pharisee means separated one. They were a, a small religious group of extremely influential people con committed to strict observance of the traditions and ordinances of Judaism. They scrupulously uh, maintained ritual purity. They, they carried out religious duties such as tradition and tithing and ceremonial washing. They're like a lot of people in church that, that, that it's all about the church and it's all about doing certain things and holding traditions and doing it a certain way. This man who went to church that day was a spiritual leader among the people. He was known and respected as a person of God. He knew the Scriptures and he had committed them to memory and even wore a leather box on his right wrist and on his forehead that contained, contained portions of the law. He would have followed the tradition of praying at least three times a day, and he prayed loud and long public prayers. He fasted twice every week on Mondays and Thursdays, and he did this as a public practice. You see, it was a public practice that they would not comb their hair, they would not wash their face, they would wear wrinkled clothes and put ashes on their face to make them look pale and somber, to make them look like they were mourning and that they were more Christ-like than other people. He tithed on everything he possessed, even the herbs that were grown in his garden. 
He would give 20 to 30 or 40 percent to the needs of the temple because the temple, the building, was very important to him. What we see is a very religious man and one that would, would many would want to be a part of their church. His problem is he was there to be heard and seen. He is a picture of many in the church today who, who, who are there uh, and, and do things for a public display to try to convince people they are pure, they're holy, they're righteous, they're approved by God. He is a picture of those who, who speak up and share their opinions about how things should be done and how things should be done and who should do things and what should be done in the church. and who, who should, They try to tell the church and the pastor what to do. But secondly, we see the publican. The publican. He was a spiritual outcast. He was welcome to come to the court of the Jews in the temple, but he was not allowed to attend the synagogue meeting. He couldn't go past the place, the place that you really could worship the Lord. Now, there are many in the church who want to keep outsiders out. I, I just got through reading a book entitled The Post-Quarantine Church by, by Tom, Tom uh, Rayner, and he said this, and I quote, one of the first things our consulting team does on site is take a tour of the church facilities. Among our many checkpoints is an inventory of the signs in and around the church. Is there good directional signage entering the parking lot? Can visitors easily locate the main entrance to the church? Are restrooms clearly marked? Are young parents able to see on their first visit where to take their children? Over the years, we have mentally noted and sometimes written about unwelcome signs. These are signs that tell members and guests what to do. Most of the time they are directed toward the guests. Don't bring food or coffee into the sanctuary. Don't enter the worship service after 11.15. Don't loiter in the parking lot. No skateboards. Don't, no trespassing signs. You get the idea. While some of these signs may be there for safety and liability, most have been posted to keep outsiders from messing up the church property. The signs are an outward expression, a physical expression of an inwardly focused church. The church facility is exclusive, an exclusive haven for just the church members. Don't disturb the religious club or any of its artifacts or its grounds or its property. And as we come out of the quarantine, many have learned that it's not about the building and we need to realize that we can do more with the building. It sits here uh, at least 95% of the time during the week empty. And there's no ministry going on. He was hated. This, this publican was hated by other Jews. He was looked down on by them. He was a tax collector, meaning that he worked for Rome. You see, Rome collected three kinds of taxes. There was the, the, the land tax, a head tax, and a custom tax. Rome levied the tax and hired chief tax collectors who then controlled the work of other tax collectors. The chief tax collector would pay Rome for a certain area, a certain district, and he would set his own rates to charge the people. He would pay Rome their portion and keep the rest and grew wealthy from extorting large sums of money from the common people. As a tax collector, he was known for his greed and dishonesty. He was viewed as a traitor by Israel. How could God love someone like that, the, the Jews thought? But we do know that God saves tax collectors. Amen? We find from the Bible that Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and after he was saved, he repaid those he had taken money from. We know that Matthew was a tax collector, and he was called to be one of the twelve by Jesus Christ. So this tax collector in our text was a man who had more than religion. He had a relationship with God. He would be like a Christian in the church who, who doesn't act the way we think, doesn't, doesn't dress like we think, is, is looked down on by others because of their past mistakes and their past life. But I'm glad that God can, can see past all that and He for, forgives us of our past, aren't you? <coughs> but secondly this morning, let's look at the two kinds of prayers. The two kinds of prayers. We see here that both of these men went to the temple to pray. When they open their mouths and begin to speak, the true character of their heart is displayed. Some say you can't judge a book by its cover, and that may be seen, but you can see what comes out of their heart and their life. The one everyone thought was righteous was really a hypocrite, and the one who people thought was a sinner was actually a child of God. These two prayers show us how that we should approach God. First, I want you to see the haughty prayer. 
the haughty prayer. When the when Pharisee begins to pray, he is quick to tell the Lord how things really are. He brags about his righteousness by comparing himself to other men. He has what I consider the Napoleon syndrome. He looks at himself, but he compares himself with everybody else, and because he doesn't measure up in his own eyes, he puts down everybody else. He sees the publican praying nearby and tells God that how much better he is than that man. The Pharisee did not really go to pray. He went to inform God how good he was. There are some who come to, to God's house not to worship, but to be seen, to tell God how much he needs them, to show others how important they are uh, uh, and how much they are needed. They spend all their time going from person to person, not really concerned about them or, or what's going on in their life, but they want them to see them, say, look at me. Their attitude is, this church can't get along without me. God is fortunate to have me in the kingdom, and this church is so blessed to have me as a member. This man bra brags about his religious works, about his giving, how great he is and how well he is doing. But he's not talking to God. According to verse 11, Verse 11 says there, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He was talking to himself. Anytime you toot your own horn, it is a very unappealing melody. This man came to church and it was all about him and not about Jesus. Look at me, he's saying. Look at what I've done. Look how important I am. What can I get from church instead of what can I give? What's in it for me? He was there to be heard. You know, one day there was a little boy. He was kneeling by his bed with his mom. And he was saying his nighttime prayers. He began to shout to the top of his lungs, Dear God, I've been real good this year, so please let me get a new bicycle for my birthday. His mom said, Son, God is not deaf. You don't need to yell. He said, I know God's not deaf, but Grandma is, and she's in the room next door. We pray thinking we've got to get to God and tell Him how much we've done for Him, how good we are. You see, this Pharisee was proud of his goodness. And the Bible says in Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride is the only sickness that everyone can recognize in the person except the person who has it. When some people pray, it must sound like the lyrics of the country song by Toby Keith. I want to talk about me. I want to talk about I. I want to talk about number one, oh my, me, my. What I think, what I like, what I know, what I want, what I see. I like talking about you, God, occasionally, but mostly I want to talk about me. Here's how you can recognize if pride is in your heart or pride is in the church. Pride loves to talk about I and what I have done. Pride seldom admits a need that they can't meet. This man had a false sense of self-sufficiency. He thought he could do it all. Pride sees the faults of others and is sure to point them out. This man was quick to criticize and condemn the tax collector. But secondly, I want you to see the humble prayer. The humble prayer. The publican does not offer swelling words of self-glorification, but instead his focus is on God. He knows that he has nothing at all to offer the Lord. He knows he is a wicked sinner who has been forgiven of his sins. And as he prays, you do not hear pride and pretense or self-righteousness. He does not attempt to justify himself in the eyes of other people or of God. He just tells the truth. He humbles himself before God and he begs for more mercy. He doesn't even lift his eyes to heaven. He's humble. He beats on his breast because he knows the real problem is a problem of the heart. With seven simple words and a broken voice, broken with emotion, he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The attitude that we need to have is, I desperately need God. I desperately need God, and we beg for more mercy. Well, we've seen the two kinds of people, the two kinds of prayer, but thirdly, notice the two kinds of pronouncements. Both of these men went to God's house and both stood to pray, but the outcome was different for each man. One man got everything while one man got nothing. For those who say, I didn't get anything out of church today, or I went to church and I just don't get anything out of it, our text teaches us something. 
If you feel that way, you are probably putting too much of yourself and your self-righteous attitude into the worship service. And that's why you leave not getting anything out of the service. You see, it's more about you than it is about Jesus. Notice two things, and we'll close very quickly. First, there is the received man. The Lord heard the wicked, sinful, hated publican. God heard his simple prayer, and he received him. His sins were forgiven. And then he went home justified in the eyes of God. Why was his worship accepted? Because he humbled himself before God, and his focus was not on himself, but on God. It was the same with Cain and Abel in the Old Testament. You know the story? And I think it's Bruce Springsteen had a song, Adam raised a lot of Cain. And, and, and he did. He raised a Cain who killed his brother Abel. But why was Abel's worship accepted? Because he worshipped according to the way God instructed. And because the focus of his sacrifice was not on himself, but on God. Cain's sacrifice was all about him, what he had done. His communication with God, with God, he, he communicated with God. He said, I didn't get what my brother did. I, don't, I didn't get accepted. I don't like what my brother got. Why do I not get the same thing? His eyes was not on the sacrifice and on God. His eyes was on his brother. The publican went to his house. That's very important here. After he went to worship, he went to his house. And all of us leave this church and we go to our homes, we go to our businesses, we go to our workplace, we go to school, we go to many different places during the week. If we have went to God's house and it's all about us and we didn't get anything, we didn't really worship God, we're going to have problems out in the real world. The man not only received a blessing, but his family also received a blessing because his worship and his life was pleasing to the Lord. Did you know that your disobedience can affect your family? Not coming to God's house, not being prepared to worship, not being part of the fellowship and the services, not being uh, obedient to the Lord, being disobedient, ignoring and avoiding God's leadership and direction, working to accomplish your agenda instead of the will of God, focusing on yourself instead of God, can and will have an effect on you, but it will also have an effect on your family. And it also affects the church family. You see, there are a lot of problems in the home. I believe that are caused by wrong worship and selfish attitudes in the church. Third, uh, the last thing we see this morning is the rejected man. The rejected man. The one who focused on himself got nothing, but the one who focused on Jesus was truly blessed. What are you focusing on when you come to church? Who are you focusing on when you come to church? The Pharisee was concerned about himself and he ignored God and he was ignored by God. The Pharisee went home feeling good about himself and that he was right with the Lord when he was actually lost in his sin. You see, the way up in the eyes of God is down. Those who humble themselves will be lifted up by God. The way to forgiveness is not to list all your good deeds, but to confess your sin. The way to be right with God is to realize just how wrong we are. The way to worship is not to worry about the building, where you sit, the programs, or the lack thereof, but to focus on Jesus. What was the main difference between these two? Attitude. A good attitude knows how to worship, stays close to the Lord, and shows spiritual maturity supports the pastor, supports the church's vision and direction, supports the ministries, supports the church by serving and supporting the church by giving. But a bad attitude shows a lack of spiritual maturity, needs to grow up and start focusing on Jesus instead of themselves. You see, this parable teaches us how that we should come and gather at church. There's nothing that we can do about how you came this morning, but there is something that can be done about how you leave this morning how you respond to the message. Will you go home justified in God's eyes? Or will you go home justified in your eyes and in the eyes of people around you? You see, I don't want to, 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 uh, to, to go home justified in the eyes of other people or in my own eyes. I want to be justified in the eyes of God. And that can only happen when we confess our sin, abandon our pride, and accept His forgiveness. It's time for many to quit exalting themselves and start humbling themselves before God so He can bless them and He can bless His church. 
How will you go home? Will you leave right with God? Or will you leave unchanged? Will you leave religious and proud of it? You know, hundreds, thousands attend church every Sunday, but they leave exactly the way they can't come in. The religious observance is something they do, and they're proud of their conduct, which is a stench in the nostrils of God. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13 says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Will you leave different? Or will you leave unburdened? Will you leave not right with God? Will you leave thankful for that? Or will you leave changed? See if we will humble ourselves. The problems, the burdens, the nitpicking that goes on in churches will cease. Jesus told this parable of those who were proud of their kind and looked down on others. Jesus wanted to open our eyes to the truth that people around us need Jesus. Our community needs Jesus and we need to be out in the highways and the hedges and quit worrying about the inside and quit being inward focused. That book that I've just got through reading, Post-Quarantine Church, you would not believe how you can look at churches today and see how inwardly focused they are. But this quarantine, hopefully, has caused us to start looking outside, to do things different than we've ever done before, to reach those that are out there that are lost and need Jesus. You see, people around us need Jesus, and we better get our eyes off of our programs, our buildings, our style of music, and get our eyes on the lost. When we are like the Pharisee, we prove that we are nothing like Jesus. As we stand, we'll be dismissed this morning. If you have a decision to make, I pray that you would make that decision. If you make it in the pew, you deal with the Lord there as He's dealing with you.